When the conference started, my main worry was that I had misinterpreted the term fat tales. As a philosopher, it just had a strong instinctive meaning that what we were talking about here was cases in which the expected costs of a certain behaviour or policy were dominated by the worst case scenario rather than being dominated by what you would expect to come out of this behaviour. And as was explained well yesterday, that's not what it was that's not what it means in the technical sense and that's not quite what it was meant to mean here. So that fat tales in the title doesn't refer to fat tales. But as the conference has gone on, this, this initial concern of mine has been replaced by a greater concern, which is that an awful lot of what I'm about to say seems to be said by other people as well. So having originally thought I would not be talking about what other people were talking about, I'm now worried I'm talking about too much. But anyway, what I want to argue is that when we face these kind of situations where there are low probability, high impact scenarios that our behavior might cause, one of the things that might give us reason not to perform these actions, even if we believe the expected costs to be less than the expected benefits, is that the distribution of these benefits and costs is unfair. And um, like various other people have suggested, um, I think there's a strong connection between our concepts of fairness and our um, desire for, to take certain kinds of precaution and I'm going to talk a bit more about that. But I do think there are two reasons why it's good to think about this in terms of fairness, even if that's not the only issue which might lead us to be precautionary in the way we respond to these kind of scenarios. One of them is that fairness is a pretty strong human motivator. And I was brought onto this by the reactions that I found with uh, my own kids and trying to motivate their behavior. And even when you've got a child very early developmental level and you're trying to teach it to be more moral, it seems like there is an instinctive idea of fairness that if you can appeal to that is a much stronger motivator than other um, kind of tricks and techniques um, that we can utilize such as you know, trying to sanction bad behavior to impart pre-arranged norms or to do um, kind of you know, recognizing other people as equal or so on. There's, there's just a sort of pretty instinctive um, motivation of fairness, and I will talk a bit about that. The other reason is that a, constant, a concern about fairness causes us to think not just about the costs of behaviors, but also about the benefits. And I think it's far too easy when you have these situations where there are potential catastrophes that would be very costly but low impact to think that, that is the, that's the key issue is trying to work out how likely these things are, how we can prevent them, um, rather than seeing them in the wider context of how these expected costs weigh up against the expected benefits. So um, I'm going to talk about three examples of fat tail risk profiles. So the first of these is what's called gain of function research into potential pandemic pathogens. This is a way of responding to the threat of global pandemics by trying to genetically engineer the sort of pathogens that will cause these pandemics in a laboratory in order to understand better how they emerge and how we can treat them. And as such, it's potentially a very fruitful area of bioresearch, but it carries a big cost, which is that, as with all biological research, there is a certain risk of laboratory acquired infection and of that laboratory acquired infection spreading. And because we are genetically engineering pathogens to be as bad as possible, these laboratory required infections could, in theory, be devastating. Um, so the um, literature on this um, oh no, hang on, we, I stand, sorry. The literature on this presents very different um, assessments of how big these risks are. So two risk analysis have been done so far and they have risk profiles that are six orders of magnitude apart. So in the most pessimistic scenario we expect there to be between 2,000 and 1.4 million expected deaths per year from this kind of research somewhere in that ballpark. In the more most optimistic it's less than one death a year, possibly as low as 0.00002 deaths a year. So. I can talk about why these, differ these two differ so far, but this at the moment is the best we've got. 
and this has kind of really dominated the discussion about this kind of research. And at the moment there is a moratorium and a big debate going on between scientists about just how risky this kind of research is. But it's very hard to see how this debate is going to get off the ground because it relies on highly counterfactual analysis. Um, those who argue that the research is safe say that basically there has not been any comparable laboratory acquired infection escape since modern safety standards were brought in um, about 20 years or so and nothing at all has ever happened at this kind of level of security that this experimentation is conducted under. Those who are more pessimistic say, well, yeah, but the laboratory acquired infections do happen all the time and we can kind of see that there is you know, a, 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 a a sort of expected profile, and yes, you know, no laboratory wide infections at this level of safety have turned up yet, yeah, but they that, that will do sooner or later, surely. And um, so the question is whether we can use the existing record to um, determine this kind of counterfactual possibility of a very escape from a very safe laboratory, or whether we have to use some other technique. And they're just it's not clear that we're going to make any progress until people actually go and do this research, by which case time's going to be too late. Um, so the second kind of behavior I want to talk about was geoengineering by, solar, uh, by stratospheric aerosol injection. And this is the idea that we um, can reverse global warming and create some level of global cooling by injecting aerosols in the same way the volcanoes do, and this has been shown to have a significant impact on global temperatures. The risk associated with this kind of behavior is that it only, in the absence of greenhouse gas reductions, it only masks the global warming. And there could come a point where either because there's been some catastrophe, a global pandemic, a nuclear war, or some other um, you know, catastrophic event, or just because we discovered that this kind of geoengineering has side effects we didn't foresee, that we have to stop the aerosol injections, at which point when we get very rapid, much very rapid um, climate change, which would be much more dangerous than even the climate change we're currently experiencing, and particularly in conjunction with the preceding catastrophe that brought about this, would constitute a potentially existential threat, or at least a very great global catastrophe. Um, and even many supporters of this suggest that um, stratospheric aerosol injection is a bad idea, but one whose time has come <laughs> because of the potential risks involved. The, the final um, kind of behavior I want to talk about briefly is climate change itself and greenhouse gas emissions. And I'm not going to talk about this very much, mostly because I said so much has been written about climate justice and fairness that I think the relatively simplistic sort of analysis I'm going to provide today doesn't add very much. But I do want to say a few things about two questions that have come up in the literature. Firstly, whether it's unfair to, um, in a sense, penalise or at least hold wealthy countries responsible for past emissions which were um, produced in ignorance of their effects and also whether it's unfair if we have um, climate abatement policies from which not everyone can expect to benefit. So having set up these kind of problems and the policy um, dilemmas that we face, let me now talk a little bit more about what I mean or what I'm going to talk about about fairness. Now it's quite common in for psychologists when they talk about fairness and justice to differentiate between two different kinds of justice, proportional, distributive justice, and procedural slash social justice. And as philosophers, we don't do that. We tend to expect that if we get the just procedures, if we get, for instance, the right kind of social contract, that that will deal with all our concerns about proportional justice, and that if our procedures deal with proportional justice, in a way that's going to answer the questions about social procedural justice. But there's actually pretty good evidence that we just respond to very different triggers with these two issues. Um, so there are these neurological scans suggesting that when people are um, faced with situations of procedural justice, this activates very different parts of their brains to when they are faced with situations of distributional slash proportional injustice. And in particular, that we react to proportional just injustice predominantly via our emotional cognition. Um, via a sense of negative affect of 
having lost out or somebody else having lost out and having very sharp emotional responses of fear, anger, sadness, revulsion, these kind of intense experiences. Whereas when we look about procedural social injustice, about whether norms are being violated, whether decisions are being come to via um, procedures that we have signed up to or that we could reasonably support, then this, these violations are processed much to, more through our social cognition and are associated with emotional responses much more on the, the kind of the, the social, um, longer lasting, less intense. We have um, you know, feelings of um, begrudging or of um, you know, friendliness or unfriendliness, but it sees quite different reactions. As a result of this, I don't think we should necessarily try and deal with every case with just one kind of principle. And I am only going to be talking about the proportional justice, proportional fairness angle. And I recognise that in doing so, I'm going to miss, leave out some important considerations of social justice and, and fairness. One thing I would say about that is I think there is a very good paper that I would say, although it doesn't conceptualise it this way, does deal with many of these social justice considerations when we do kind of risk analysis, and that's John Joe Wolf's um, paper about blame and shame and responsibility in cost-benefit analysis and his account of why it is that certain individuals in policy positions or certain industries tend to take very different attitudes towards risk prevention to others and we seem to find this socially acceptable. So I'm not going to repeat what he says or try and put that into my analysis. Instead, what I'm going to try and do is to bring together what I see as some of the um, most successful notions of proportional fairness. Two in particular, the one that seems to be very compelling in that he keeps on, people keep on coming back to it again and again and again, despite the fact that it has been widely uh, objected to, disproved, abused, thrown away, <coughs> forgotten about, rediscovered and buried in salt peat for six months which is the lucky egalitarianism, um, and a more recent, potentially more successful uh, view that Mike and Alex here at the LSE and Mark Flaube and others have come up with this, which is competing claims view, and I want in a way to sort of try and come up with a conception of fairness that I think takes important insights from both of these. So lucky egalitarian, the slogan, it's unfair that one is worse off than others through no fault or choice of one's own. And I think this has two really important insights in the way that we think about proportional justice and fairness. The first is that it's not just about one kind of good. It's not just about equality. It's about actually bringing together different ideals. Um, and they're usually ideals that are about being better off or worse off than X. X can be another person. X can be the ideal that we think we deserve. X can be the other possibilities that we might have had. X can be some other imagined possibility outside of the conceptual space, but that nevertheless has some moral importance to us. And what the successful um, conception of proportional justice is going to do is it's going to show the relation between these different moral ideals. The other thing I find very powerful about the lucky egalitarian um, uh, slogan, and which has recently been explored quite a lot by Shlomo Seagal, is that it's asymmetrical. Um, it says that it's un unfair to be worse off than others through no fault of one's own. It doesn't say anything about the justice of being equally well off than others, even if one didn't deserve it, for instance, um, or about being better off than others. And I think, again, this is quite strongly backed up by the psychological, neurological evidence about how we respond to these cases. It's negative affect, the sense of loss or the sense of harm that really drives our sense of um, proportional injustice. The second conception of proportional injustice, of competing claims here, I'm not going to read the whole quote, um, but it's up there. But what I take from this view is, firstly, that there is only injustice where people could have been better off, where they have, their interests have been um, affected negatively. It's not unjust to be worse off than others where one could not be, have been better off. And this is important because there are plenty of cases that have been used against the concept of proportional justice, such as the leveling down objection, the mere addition paradox, where you argue that we create inequality, we don't make anyone worse off, and there doesn't seem to be anything bad about it. Um, the other thing that's very interesting about the competing claims view is the suggestion that where you have these competing moral ideals, 
part of the relationship between them is productive. That is that X is bad and Y is bad, but X and Y are really, really bad. Um, and I think also, well, I haven't talked about it here, when we have proportional justice and we have social justice, both of these are bad, but the combination of those two things seems to be especially bad. So we have a non-linear attitude towards fairness. Um, so I express these in the following kind of principles. So firstly, it's unfair to be worse off than one might have been. It's unfair to be worse off than one deserves to be, though not where one could not have been any better off, even if we think that the ancient Egyptians deserved everything that we have. They couldn't have had it because of the technological uh, barriers to them living the kind of lives that we live. And that's not unfair, that's just life. You know, some people were born earlier, some were born later, some have access to technology, some don't. But that there are people who still live these stunted, peasant lives, that is unfair because these people could be helped. And thirdly, of course, uh, it's unfair, it's really unfair if people are made worse off than others, though perhaps not if they don't deserve to be, and certainly not if they couldn't be any better off. And because these um, different uh, ideals um, combine productively, we have some cases where you can say, yeah, that's unfair, but it's, it's trivial. And the literature seems to be you know, conducive to producing various of these um, cases. The one I've listed here, which some of you may be aware of through the work of Larry Temkin, and but it was produced by Mike and Alex, is this, it's called Progressive Disease 3. And the basic idea is that people are suffering from a progressive disease, and we have to treat them in order. And there's one person who we have to decide whether to put them at the front of the queue or the back of the queue. And if we put them at the back of the queue, everyone else gets moved up one space, gets treated slightly <coughs> earlier, gets a s relatively small benefit, but that individual receives a very big harm because if they were at the front of the queue, they'd have been treated first and have very few side effects. Because they're treated last, they will have profound effects in their disease. This compares to other cases in which you have what look like very similar kinds of unfairness, but they're not trivial, they're trumping. So Jones's hands, you know, it's a similar setup. We have one person who's going to receive either significant harm or no harm, and everyone else might benefit a bit, in this case, from watching the football match rather than from having slightly early medical treatment. But we can set up the costs and benefits in the same way here. But because in Jones's hand, we're actually affecting the distribution, we're making one person worse off than everyone else. And there's a, they, you know, there's a time in which nobody deserves to suffer from that, whereas in the progressive disease case, somebody's going to be worse off. And yeah, no one you know, deserves what's going to happen to them, but because we're not affecting the overall distribution, we're not affecting the fact that some people are going to get what they deserve and some people aren't. One of these cases, it's unfair, but who cares? If it was even of slight benefit to treat this individual last, we probably would agree to do that. In the Jones's hand case, we would give up <coughs> all of the benefits of the case, it seems, in order to avoid the harm. So, how do these um, kind of considerations relate to the risky behaviours that I've talked about? Well, in the gain of function research, I think it's pretty straightforward. What happens is um, that everyone loses out if there is a global pandemic caused by this genetically engineered superbug. But whether, who benefits from this research depends on exactly the kind of research that we undertake. So if we undertake research into preventing real catastrophic global pandemics, such as the Spanish flu or the Black Death, um, which could occur and you know, should be taken seriously as, a, as, as potential global catastrophes, everyone could be harmed by the, pan by the research, but everyone will benefit from the treatment. And so in this case, there is a you know, good reason to just add up the costs and the benefits. And so long as the benefits outweigh the costs, so yeah, that's probably research that's worthwhile um, undertaking. And so, for instance, with pandemic influenza, there is a prediction that there are 700,000 expected deaths from um, global pandemics of influenza at current global population levels. These are very strongly weighted towards the global pandemics of which there have been six in the last 300 years, and particularly one, the Spanish influenza of 1918, which accounts for the majority of the deaths. But 
If we could prevent that kind of pandemic happening in the future, 700,000 deaths is greater than everything but the very most pessimistic projections for how dangerous. Um, so 700,000 deaths per year is, is, is equivalent to every, all but the, the most pessimistic accounts of how bad the research might be. So if we think that there's a reasonable chance of curing even, preventing even one Spanish influenza type situation, then yeah, let's do it. But the other alternative is, well, what if the research gets hijacked by the economically more lucrative seasonal influenza treatment, probably much easier to you know, work out how the strains of flu currently um, predominating in East Asia are going to transform, and we might well make seasonal flu treatments that are more effective and people will be willing to pay more for. So there's more obvious economic model for this, but if, if the influenza research were used for something along those lines, then only a very small minority of people would benefit. And so even if the benefits outweigh the costs, still outweigh the costs, um, it would be unfair, unreasonable, unjust to do this research. And even if the benefits outweigh the cost by a big margin, because it's going to be the worst off who are worst affected both by the pandemic and because they don't stand to benefit from the research, this is much more of a sort of trumping type claim of unfairness. Um, sorry, I'm not keeping up with my talk. So, the geoengineer, the stratospheric aerosol injection is slightly more complicated here because we've got more policy options. Um, on the one hand, we might say that these, the aerosol injection itself is most likely to benefit countries who are worse off. We know that there are countries that are already suffering harm from climate change. If we used stratospheric aerosol injection today, we could help those countries. We wouldn't do much to benefit um, most wealthy countries, and indeed some wealthy countries, particularly in the, the far north, would be harmed by this policy. So there is some background condition of unfairness in utilising this technology to remove these, the current effects of climate change, but this is a much more trivial concern because these costs will fall upon the best off, not upon the worst off. People are not going to be made worse off than others by uh, this kind of activity. So it's, it's a legitimate concern, but if the benefits outweigh the costs, it's likely that we could justify this kind of uh, geoengineering. It gets more complicated, where, however, when you consider whether or not, having introduced the engineering, we should then act to reduce carbon emissions. So if we do act to reduce carbon emissions, this will greatly reduce the risks associated with the solar radiator forcing, but it will also be costly, um, and those costs will have to be distributed if we don't, we get, in effect, um, we lose the, the cost associated with climate change at uh, probably a fraction of the cost of actually having to take action to reduce our carbon emissions, but we retain the existential threat um, posed by the double catastrophe. What I argue is that um, the, if, if we were to carry on global emissions under the stratospheric aerosol forcing, this would be of greatest benefit to those countries that stand to gain, that gain most from current carbon emissions and stand, would stand to lose most from having to reduce them, which are predominantly the wealthy countries. And so um, if those countries sought to benefit by introducing stratospheric aerosol injection and not reducing their carbon emissions, that would itself be highly unfair because it would benefit these countries disproportionately, but everyone would face the existential risk of these climate emissions. On the other hand, if we do reduce greenhouse gas emissions, or if we at least, the wealthy countries reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, but we perhaps allow some more greenhouse gas emissions from developing countries to allow them to catch up, then either this would produce a fair outcome or it would produce an outcome whose unfairness again would be relatively trivial. It's in effect then, what the existential risk associated with this kind of geoengineering does is not to um, say that we shouldn't undertake this kind of um, geoengineering, but that we shouldn't take this kind of geoengineering as a means of preserving an unfair distribution of global resources or of trying to benefit the, those countries who are already well off. 
um, and it requires that should we use this sort of global e engineering, we aim at a more um, equitable distribution of resources. I'm kind of tempted to just go skip through the climate change itself because I'm aware I'm running over time. Very, very briefly, the idea is that because fairness on this model doesn't depend on how well off or how badly off you are, but on whether you are benefiting or whether you are being harmed, it is not enough to defend the claim that um, past emissions were done in ignorance in order to say that they are unfair. The question is who are those past emissions currently benefiting the most and who is the current emission system currently benefiting the most and who is being harmed by this system. And here you can see that even today the pattern of advantage and disadvantage from greenhouse gas emissions and from the global energy market tends to favour those who are already well off, creating conditions that are highly unfair on this model. Given that, and um, given the fact again that continuing to benefit would in itself be unfair, we therefore have um, an argument, a strong argument against the claim that it's fairness requires that everyone benefit from uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. Instead, it should be the case that people are not harmed um, who so the, the people are not harmed by the present greenhouse gas emissions and that whatever system we use to introduce um, reductions in those emissions aims to produce a more fair distribution. We can talk about that in questions if people want. So the, the uh, last thing I want to talk about is a bit about the non-identity problems because when you introduce fairness it's the person affecting um, condition and... Simon, just to let you know, I mean, you're we're cutting into the Q&A here quite a bit already. Oh, okay. All right. Up to, up to you, how much you want to take. Sorry about that. Okay, so when you have person affecting conditions like this, um, there are concerns that um, people, if people's identity depends upon what we do, they aren't really harmed. So there's an argument that says that anyone who exists in the future, the environment in which they come into existence will in part be determined by my current actions. Therefore, their identity will be determined by these actions. And so I don't make them worse off by acting one way rather than another. And I think that it's possible to respond to this by pointing out that often when we talk about harming, what we really want to talk about is not whether or not somebody could be better off, but whether they have been made better off by the effects of my actions, or made worse off by the effects of my actions. Um, I then argue that we can distinguish between what I call identity contingent effects. Identity contingent effects are the effects of my actions that are contingent upon the fact they change people's identity. So the fact that a child is born at a particular time, has a certain genetic disease, and so on, or indeed that they exist at all, these are identity contingent benefits or harms. But the fact, if I, was, for instance, were to plant a bomb that exploded in a hundred years' time, the harm caused by that bomb would not be contingent upon the identity of the people it affected. Obviously, exactly who it affected would be, but the harm it caused wouldn't be. So we can still counterfactually say that these people would be better off in a scenario in which I hadn't acted as I did, even though there is, in fact, no scenario in which they exist in which I hadn't acted as I did because my actions determine their identity. Um, can we justify morally important claims on these kind of um, conditional statements where the antecedent could not be true? I think there's an argument that we can, and the example that I point to is Harry Frankfurt's compatibilist conception of free will, where we say that for a person to have free will doesn't mean that they could. There is another situation in which they acted differently to how they did, only that if there were some other situation in which their psychological state, their volition had been different, then in that outcome they would have acted differently than they have free will, irrespective of whether we perceive that outcome as a real possibility or not.